Welcome back. Um, sorry we lost you earlier. I think we're going to do a take two version of um, the, the vows. Um, it's a bit of a shame because we had quite a good conversation. I enjoyed it. Um, but we were buffering about him with the losing connection. But um, I'm sure this conversation will be quite different because we can't reproduce these yes. things. And, uh, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in our conversations. Yeah. But, uh, well, we were talking about giving ourselves to God, weren't we? So um, that includes our failures. One of the things that we spoke about in your absence uh, was Brother Gildas preparing for his solemn vows. And I thought I'd read out the profession formula that we canons of Premontre profess. I, Brother N, offer and give myself to the Church of Our Lady of Sorrows and St. Philip Benizzi, and I promise a conversion of my ways and life in community, especially in poverty, consecrated celibacy and obedience, according to the Gospel of Christ and the Apostolic Way of Life, according to the rule of St. Augustine and the constitutions of the Order of Premontre. I promise this before Hugh, the prelate of this church, and the brothers. And so as canons regular of Premontre, as well as the three evangelical councils of poverty, chastity and obedience, we also profess stability. Our vows are professed to a particular church. And so it's one of the defining features of our life, which makes us sons, if you were, of that particular place. And we bind ourselves to each other as well. So you, Brother Gildas, are binding yourself to me <laughs> and to the rest of our motley crew. So can you say a little about what you found strange about vow life or how you're preparing for solemn vows or any reflections or thoughts you might have? Well, something which I didn't mention earlier and it's just come to my head now um, was when I took my simple vows, so we're, as an ancient order in the church, we take simple vows for three years, so which means at the end of the three years I'm free to walk away, or during that time, or the community is free to ask me to leave, um, as a preparation for solemn vows, vows for life, ones that we can't get out of really. And the first thing I noticed when I took my simple vows was how much more a person of God we become. Not, you know, special or sanctified personally in a holy way. That's a work that goes on mm -hmm. in life. But as if God was a bit more in control. A bit like a horse with the reins. Um, I wasn't freer in my own selfish way to do whatever I liked. But I understood a much better freedom. Mm -hmm. So things would happen more, coincidences, or people who would come up to me in the street, or various other things. I felt as if God was helping me out mm -hmm. more. I did have that feeling, as if, not that I'd you know, be able to do anything that I wanted, but it became, there was a more of a, God gave me more grace to encounter situations in life. I remember that, but in terms of preparation for the for my solemn vows, well, this these three years, and then the year and then the vitiate before that, a preparation for the simple vows, um, uh, is a wonderful experience of the way, a tiny experience, I'm sure, of the way God trains the soul, prepares us to advance, hopefully, in the spiritual life, gives us hints on how he works things out for people. Um, I mentioned before how I expected lots of graces mm. to come my way and uh, special things just for myself, like chocolate eggs or whatever. Um, got but I might, I've got plenty. <laughs> but, um, but I meant, um, you know, personal things to me. And I, I realised after this event in my life, I'll repeat very quickly, um, when I was kind of complaining to the Lord, well, where are these special feelings or special graces or special things in my life? Because um, I've given my whole life to you, I'm expect, you know, I expected something back in return. 
Anyway, I had a nap this up that afternoon, and um, when I woke up, there were three text messages left on my phone from three different friends, none of whom were Catholic, all three of them expressing a desire to become Catholics. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying my giving myself to the order was the cause of that grace, because God is giving these people graces, but it may have helped in some way. And I believe it did, possibly. Um, because I had the immediate feeling, the prayerful feeling, that the Lord was saying, well, that is the grace that I'm giving you. I'm asking you to become a conduit of grace. A pipeline, really. You know, that's what I see. And it's a bit like the, the, definitely the priesthood doesn't really matter about the worthiness of the priest in the sense of the sacraments, the celebration of the sacraments. Of course, the priest is called to be extremely holy, an, imi an imitator of Christ. But God still works with that man, despite the person in many instances. So it's a, I had the feeling that God was working through me despite myself in mm -hmm. a way, or... That are, and I mentioned this priest in the seminary and how I spoke with him recently about this, and he said that's exactly what the priesthood is, or the religious life. It's a giving of ourselves for the sake of the whole world. Mm. Um, not for our own salvation as much, but for the salvation of the world. And I think I mentioned before the fatherhood aspect, which you'd yeah. spoken about last week, Father Pass. The perfect fatherhood of Christ on the cross. Um, fatherhood is complete giving of oneself for one's children, for one's family, for one's loved ones, and a good father for anyone. Um, God, the perfect father, gives himself for all. And um, there's that kind of aspect of giving ourselves for the sake of the whole world because we love the world mm. and that's something we've learned from the gospel to love the world as Christ loves the world and to give ourselves I was actually thinking during the kind of intermission and um, the forced intermission <laughs> you know it's a bit like a father I'll never forget the story of Evelyn War during the war. Um, and his children came around and he'd had this special delivery of bananas. And sad to say, Evelyn War could, could sometimes be a, not a very good father. And he decided to eat all the bananas in front of Aldrin and his siblings. So he, but Evelyn took delight in the bananas couldn't have bananas during the war, so he found these bananas and he ate them. A real father would take delight in seeing his children eating those bananas, mm -hmm. whilst he himself goes without. And I think that's something, especially the priesthood, and of mm -hmm. course we're a, can, we're a clerical order, we're here for the whole world, mm -hmm. for the parish, for the, the other parishes in Chelmsford, for the community, for each other, but also for the whole world. Yes. Our first work as canons regular is the singing of divine office. Um, that's shared by all of the canons and all of, associated with all the orders, including canonesses and indeed third order members as well. And we're reminded, or reminded when you're speaking, that we sing the office for the church and for the world, not for ourselves. No, exactly. It's part of our, our duty is to praise God and intercede before him for the church and for the world. And so the religious life and the priesthood, but even the religious life on its own, is sort of a life given to others. It's a life for others, which is very important. Exactly. And if God chooses to give us consolations or whatever to aid us in advancing in this life, mm. Um, so be it, but it's not about that, and the joy doesn't come from that. I was expecting consolations, I was quite immature in that sense. 
of a particular kind, but the constellations are quite different. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're far more profound. Mm. And they teach us about the sacrificial joy of love. Mm. To see other people advance towards God, run towards God, mm. leap and dance towards God, is a great joy. Even if we're sat there knowing this may, I may be playing a part in this, but I can't feel it. Mm -hmm. Well, we trust in God that he calls us all to different kinds of vocations. It's mm -hmm. a bit like Therese of Lisieux. Mm -hmm. She's the patron saint of the missions. She sat as an enclosed nun her mm -hmm. whole life. But her prayer aided the apostolic work of the church in ways that we will, we will find out, please God, in heaven these things. Mm -hmm. But the mystery of it all, how the church as a body, a living body, we all have our vocation and we aid the growth of this body in what we're called to do. Mm -hmm. It's a wonder. Mm. And I think we spoke as well, I don't know if it was picked up when we were talking about the vows in particular, we spoke about how the vows are all subsumed, the vows of poverty, consecrated celibacy and obedience, into love. And if celibacy, for instance, does not make us love more, love God more, and love other people more, then it's entirely futile. Exactly. It's the vows are there, the evangelical councils are there to open us up to the love of God um, so that we can become more, more who we should be, and therefore to be able to show his love to the people around us in community, and in the in in the streets outside in Chelmsford and through you know the modern means of technology people all around the world and as you said there's a great privilege to be able to accompany people as they run and leap and dance in the love of God and discover these joys and it is an exercise of spiritual paternity which is absolutely fantastic. There's something I've, I've struggled over the years discerning a vocation, you know, it can be, well, whatever, for me, and avoiding um, commitments and various other things. But there's one thing I've always known that I wasn't called to be, and that's why it's been quite, you know, it was quite a painful few years, because I knew that I wasn't called to be a bachelor. I don't want to be a bachelor. And now lots of people, I remember Ian Paisley once shouting and screaming about the bachelor priests in the Catholic Church. We're not bachelors. We're people who love the world and are vowed to the people of God. Mm. And it is like a marriage. So mm -hmm. it's, we're vowed to God and through that, vowing ourselves to the divine life, to his people. Mm. As fathers, not as, um, not as selfish men or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not saying all bachelors are but that opening up of our hearts to loving the whole world. And I know, you know, lots of bachelors can do that, of course. But it's not about being myself in yes. some ways. We, we discussed this when we were thinking what we were going to talk about. We discussed one of the things that I wanted to mention was that idea of the bachelor life or the single life as being a vocation which I've heard some people ask, and some people in fact say, could, can I go after the single life as a vocation? And I'm afraid I would say the single life, in the, I'm not, in the sense of just being a man or woman in the world with no commitments, is not a vocation. Now there are me very, very many men and women who live good and holy lives um, as single people in the world. And they may well be much holier than I am. So that's a different question to should I seek the single life or the life of a bachelor as my vocation? Because there is something inherent in the nature of commitment, the commitment of religious vows, the commitment of marriage vows, or whether you're a hermit or whatever, something about that commitment, which is a means and a very important means of sanctification. If one is entirely self-directing, then it's very difficult to live 
a holy life. Not impossible, of course, but difficult. That is why the church promotes marriage, the sacrament given to us by God, and through a religious life as a particular flowering of the grace of the Holy Spirit as these means of sanctification, not the same in themselves, uh, obviously, but these are promoted by the church in a way that the single life is not promoted as a vocation in itself. And as single people being attached to parishes mm. and to lay apostolates and other things as a help, mm. you know, which Absolutely. can be a, a form of commitment, mm. but in that kind of radical commitment. Mm. Um, and I think we, the religious life has a particular place in the church. Mm -hmm. And I think we spoke about this, well, we did speak about this earlier in the, in the broken up broadcast, mm -hmm. um, as a fulfillment of that primary vocation, the Christian vocation, which we receive in our baptism. Yes. The religious life is a flowering of that vocation in this world, on this planet, in this life. Um, it's a it's a wonderful way of, if we live it well by God's grace, mm -hmm. or we try to live it well, reaching, and we mentioned the word perfection before, mm -hmm. and you explained it, being able to at least advance in the ways of perfection, mm -hmm. easier, in some, well for me, and I'm sure married people would find it easier for them mm -hmm. in that state, you know, and of course they do. So we have, God has, planned these things for all of us mm -hmm. that we might as saint paul says work out our salvation in fear and trembling indeed and so preparing for my vows i have to mention that then there is a certain anti anticipation of fear and trembling mm. i'm of course i'm not worthy enough i don't need to even mention that mm. um what is this mystery? Why would God want me? I don't understand it. We were talking earlier about characters from the Old and New Testaments, from the life of the church. Um, Saint Louis Marie de, Mon de Montfort, when he said, if I hadn't lived this life as a priest, as a religious, he would have been the worst criminal in French mm -hmm. history. I really feel like that sometimes. For me, it's kind of all or nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I find it difficult to try, and most people do, and they do it successfully, live a holy life in the world. Mm -hmm. Because I just, I have to be hot or cold. And it's kind of, and for me, this is the kind of one option. Mm -hmm. And it's a radical option. Mm -hmm. I don't, it's not, you, you don't enter the, we don't just find ourselves with a habit on one yeah. day. It's something that takes a lot of prayer mm -hmm. and discernment and trials and temptations. And they continue throughout our yes. whole lives. And, and at the end, you just have to do it then, don't you? Lots of people, I'm not sure if you spoke about this last week, but lots of people have asked kind of vocation and have asked me, you know, when did you know that you were going to be a religious or a priest. And of course there is a story, um, which I could bore you with another time if I haven't bored you with anyway. But uh, the truth of the matter is on the day of my solemn profession, because that's the day when I was actually called by the church. I was called forward from sitting next to my mum in the front pew of Our Lady Immaculate, and I was called forward by the church, and I said, ad sum, present. That's when I knew I had a vocation. There was preparation beforehand and all of that, but that was the moment I was actually called. And I think lots of people today have a difficulty with commitment for many understandable reasons. Many people, I fear, don't want to make a mistake. And I can understand that, but the only sure way to never make a mistake is never to try anything. And that's not going to advance your, your love for God. I'm not saying you just try everything and then say, oh, you know, married for 17 years, that hasn't worked, I'm going to go off and you know, become a hermit in the Egyptian desert. I'm not advocating that. But you do need to put your foot forward and start walking somewhere. 
and God will provide. Exactly. Trust God, as Father Albert says here often, trust God and the providence of God will lead us. Mm. It's amazing the places God will lead us to. I'm always fascinated by so-called coincidences in life, God incidences, <laughs> these things that, you know, bumping into someone and then we become friends with them and all these other things. And it leads us throughout life. One of these coincidences happened at Father Pius's um, solemn profession <laughs> because I was the photographer there. Indeed. And I'm still waiting to be paid for yes. this. <laughs> it's the only reason he's here. <laughs> it's the only reason. <laughs> but these little things mm. that happen along the way that don't make any sense at the time, I'm sure we, we've all experienced this in life, especially in the spiritual life. When we have faith in God, we can see it. We can see life for what it is, in many instances, far more than people without faith. So thank God for the gift of faith. Mm. The weaving of this pattern that God is creating, and it's beautiful. Mm. So just hand yourselves over to God mm. constantly, and he will lead your lives mm. in the most wonderful way exciting way. I remember when I was working, I had an office in um, Westminster Cathedral then, um, not a big office anyway, but uh, I just sat there once and I was living in central London and the light, because I'm from the wilds of Wales, and I remember sitting there thinking just a simple thought, not a great ideological thought anyway, I just thought, if I hadn't have been baptised when I was 16, I wouldn't be here now. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had this adventure of this journey, which would have been beyond my wildest dreams 20 years before, mm -hmm. let's say. Or, I mean, two years before, let's say. No, but all those years before, when I was baptised, I never expect, and that's just a practical example, mm -hmm. But in terms of the life of the Spirit, I always say to people, especially when I've helped Father Pius with the RCIA course in my novitiate, go for it, be baptised. It's the most important thing that will ever happen to us in our life because it opens up the world of the Spirit to us, the mm. spiritual dimension, the world of God and the angels and the saints, the world of grace. The real world. The real world. Absolutely. Well, that's my Augustinian <laughs> way to it. Um, it is the real world, and it's beyond our wildest dreams. Mm. So put your foot in that world and enter into it. I'll never forget years and years ago being on Anglesey with a friend of mine, a very good friend, and my sister. And we visited a holy well on Anglesey, and I was about to go to the seminary the first time round ballad lid many years ago and we visited this one place which is very special to me it's a, an old monastery of canons regular of saint augustine and there's a saint the saint one of the patron saints of anglesey there serial i was going to take that and i did ask to have that name as my religious name but it's just too confusing but people would be calling me serial <laughs> that sounds like a cornflake spot but anyway we went to visit saint serial and I really felt the saint calling me to go and visit his well. You know, I am a cat, so... <laughs> and we went and visited, and I turned to my sister, my friend, and I said, put your hands in this water now, this hut which had been his baptismal font. And we put our hands in the water, and all of us felt the moving, the grace of the Holy Spirit. We were filled with tears and pure joy, and it's one of those little moments, we all have them in our spiritual lives, um, a mountaintop experience that keep us going, mm. because we kind of touched the real life. Mm. It's quite odd, it was just putting our hands in this water, and we felt something. So God gives us, us, gives us these glimpses, mm. and I think we need, I need them in order to come towards mm. this life. But then he kind of withdraws, and there's a period of purgation, possibly, for people, and other things of growth. 
So the preparation for the vows is something that is of a particular limited time. But of course, really, it's preparation for that real life which goes on forever for our lives in this world. Mm -hmm. God will give us enough time to get towards there that we have to cooperate with, with him in that work of grace. There'll, there'll be men and women out there watching who might be thinking of the religious life, the vowed life, and to any man or woman or young man or young, young woman thinking of religious life, my advice would be try it. Yes. Visit a monastery, contact a vocations director, research, look around, because I can honestly say that I can't imagine any life that would bring me more joy than being a religious, thanks be to God. And the vowed life, the gift of self to God in the complete way in which religious do, is a sacrifice and a joy and a consolation and a purgation and all of those things and much more. Uh, it's wonderful. The vows, I remember Father Stephen telling me in my novitiate, um, and the offering of self, the complete offering of self, as imperfect to the perfect God, and the desire to do it in a way that's holy and beautiful, despite our imperfections and sins, we try our best and it's a bit like the throwing of the most, the sweetest smelling incense on the charcoal. And we get spent, mm. or it's like a candle, hopefully for God's glory. But we give ourselves completely to him. And he does with us whatever he wants. And like those servants in the Gospel of St. Luke, we were talking about our favourite well, mine's Luke, I've always liked the Gospel of Luke, our favourite books in the Bible, and Genesis, a bit like our Holy Father Augustine, I'm a bit yes. obsessed with Genesis. <laughs> but Luke, like those servants, we merely did our duty. And to do our duty in the grace of God is to transform the world. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And the fact I can never understand why God would want to call me to this. Mm -hmm. Because I think every other person on the planet would do a better job of it mm -hmm. and would be better and holier. So why call me? I often think if I was God, I would never choose me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so thank God I'm not God. Because God's ways are not your ways. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And uh, thank God for that, because yes. God sees something else that not even we can see about ourselves. He sees what he's created us to be. Mm -hmm. And we're still struggling, looking in that dark mirror, mm -hmm. hoping, trusting that God's will will be done, and we will reach that state of perfection mm -hmm. with Christ. And that's our life, really, is mm -hmm. the adventure we're so fortunate, Father Pius, I think, aren't we, to have, mm. despite the struggles and the difficulties of our way of life, and I know lot, it's not a life of most people, but it's a life that comes with so many blessings. Mm. Um, so many blessings. Mm. And often we don't even notice them. Oh, indeed, yes, yeah. It's, um, it's a wonder. Um, I like just wearing a habit, for example, mm. Um, walking through the streets of London, whatever, or Chelmsford, and the fact that someone will come and chat with me. Mm -hmm. Often homeless people will come because they know that this person, if only they knew who was inside the habit, but because they see the habit, they realise this person will give them time. Mm -hmm. And it's a privilege to give them time. And often God comes to my aid in those situations because I'm not very good with people. But maybe with certain situations, God helps me out. Mm. Um, and just these little things that we're privileged in, even to be shouted at or abused for wearing the habit. I know they're not shouting at me. It doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. They're not shouting at me. They're reacting 
to the gospel, to mm -hmm. what they see, to Christ, to God, to something they don't yet understand. But please, God, one day they will. Indeed, yes. And we're all, as you know, to, to round up, we started talking about how religious life is a deepening of the baptismal call, and we're all, as Christians, called to be a sign of contradiction to the world, because we are not citizens of the world in that sense. We are citizens of heaven. We're pilgrims passing through this world. And so the Christian life will always be a sign of contradiction to the world. Look at Cardinal Pell, you know, for instance. There are many things that one could say. One, one of those things I would say is that he was a sign of contradiction um, to the world. That held, he held up a mirror to Australian society. Not that he was perfect, nobody is. And he suffered for that, not, of course, in the way that many others have suffered at the, the hands of clerics who abused their position, but he was a sign of, is a sign of contradiction. And as religious, we are called to perpetuate that sign of contradiction, the vow of poverty, where we give up everything that we have, don't even have a bank account, um, in consecrated celibacy, we give up the prospect of marriage, and in obedience, we give up our wills. And so we're saying to the world, there's more to life than this. And the perfect sign of contradiction, of course, is the cross. Exactly. The glorious, most wonderful, most painful cross of Christ, mm -hmm. which is a stumbling block for some and folly to others. Yes. But for those of us who have faith and knowledge of Christ, it's the way to heaven. Mm -hmm. And it's the most beautiful thing as um, well, I was saying in the earlier broadcast, um, Saint, this documentary I saw on Saint Louis de Montfort here last night. He was, he, our Lord is wedded to the cross. Mm. The cross is his spouse, and it's the means of salvation, and that's the instrument that he chooses to save the whole world and to demonstrate his love. And in that point on the cross, he's the perfect religious, mm -hmm. in Indeed. that sense. Um, with, he's given up his, his will, his wealth, and any personal kind of attachments mm -hmm. for the sake of everyone and everything, and for the sake of his heavenly Father. Yes. So the cross is the way of salvation, it's the way of the Christian. And it's especially our way as religious. Mm. So um, that's vows. That's vows. <laughs> and, and some else besides. <laughs> yeah, and some more that we missed because <laughs> it kept breaking off. Yes. So we'll, I'll finish uh, by giving you a blessing. And so we'll remember, I'm sure, Brother Gildas in our prayers in particular um, at this time. And we'll ask our Almighty Father to make Brother Gildas a religious and a shepherd after his own heart. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by, by your holy, holy cross you, you have redeemed, redeemed the world. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.